Good morning, Andover. I'm Kyla Ashisunderam, returning lower from Cupertino, California. And I'm Allie Bolinke, a senior from Durwood, Maryland. Today, today, our guest speaker embraces the equality and honors the legacy that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. strived for in the world. Mr. Steve Pemberton is a successful corporate businessman and an advocate for educating youth. However, at a very young age, Mr. Pemberton was told that he had no chance in this world. Growing up as an orphan, Mr. Pemberton was placed under the care of monstrous families, where he was told that he was dumb and ugly and did not deserve to go to college. On one occasion, Mr. Pemberton was beaten after receiving straight A's on his report card. Despite the adversity, Mr. Pemberton beat the odds. Pemberton read voraciously, knowing that education was the only way out of hardship. Through grit, hard work, and determination, Mr. Pemberton attended Boston College on a full scholarship. Today, Mr. Pemberton is the first Chief Diversity Officer of Walgreens. At the forefront of diversity practices, Mr. Pemberton directs activities to help serve a variety of markets and populations. His awe-inspiring novel, A Chance in the World, has intrigued thousands. Mr. Pemberton's story is an inspiring one, one that displays amazing fortitude and courage. Mr. Pemberton is a living example that with resiliency and the drive to overcome hardship, we too can achieve success. From a boy who had no chance in this world, to Savoy Magazine's top 100 most influential African Americans in corporate America, Mr. Pemberton made it from the bottom to the top. Without further ado, please welcome Mr. Steve Pemberton. It's coordinated too. You like how it just matches everything? And so make sure that you, you check me before I leave here because I may make it back on the plane uh, with me. So, you know, and uh, I was trying to restrain myself from joining the choir. And since I, you know, I absolutely can't sing, um, I, was, I was sparing you actually. So thank you very much. Uh, for this wonderful invitation to join you uh, here today. It means a lot to be back home in Massachusetts. This is where I'm from, born and raised here. Uh, and so I live in Chicago these days where they constantly make fun of my Boston accent. And I actually uh, further this by talking about parking the car in Harvard Yard. I just <laughs> want to make them feel mwah, completely at home, uh, which is pretty much what I do. So I'm glad that nobody here said I talk funny which is uh, actually a very good thing. So the way the speech thing is supposed to work, at least this is what they tell me, that I have a job. And so my job is to talk, and apparently your job is to listen. And uh, if the whole trick of it is that I'm uh, supposed to make sure that I stop doing my job before you stop doing yours. <laughs> now, w when I went to Boston College, I joined a fraternity, all the members of the fraternity, who said, look, Steve, Whenever you have something important to say, in a short period of time to say it, uh, all that you really need to remember to be successful are the five Bs. And the five Bs meant, be brief, brother, be brief. <laughs> so in conclusion, I want to thank you again. <laughs> I love to laugh and usually at myself, so you're just going to be along for the ride. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so th three things uh, quickly that I'll talk about. One is about Dr. King. The other is about diversity and what it means, what we think it means, and what it actually is. And then my own personal reflections along the way. Although I can honestly tell you that so much of how I think about this topic uh, came from a conversation that occurred when I was four years old. I was sitting in the car with a social worker after my, what felt to me like my 10th visit to a foster home trying to find a place to live. I was this collision of labels, African American, blue eyes, light complexion, a Polish last name of Klakowicz, and blonde tints in the crowns of my hair. 
And so nobody knew what to do with me, which is why I kept going from one home to another home trying to find a place to stay. And at four years old, I asked a social worker, why is this so hard? Why can't I find a real home? And she said, well, it's because we don't know whether you belong with a white family or a black family. And about the only thing that I experienced in the way of color at four years old was a box of crayons. So when she said a white family or a black family, I thought that she was referring to the color of the house. And I remember asking, well, why does it matter what color the house is painted? I just need a family. And all these years later, I haven't really stopped thinking that way. I haven't stopped thinking that way. And so I think of Dr. King in his life in, in that context. Uh, it's an impossible task, actually probably a fool's errand, to talk about Dr. King uh, on his day because no, nothing and no one can match the, his eloquence and his passion and the principles. Well, he wasn't perfect, certainly, but he believed that America was perfectible. And that tradition stands and sits with us, even today. And we have a tendency to reduce him to a speech or a quote, and I understand that. I understand the power and the significance that that holds for, for each of us. And it's true, certainly, that he was a dreamer, although it's a source of tremendous irony to me that if I held up the draft of the notes that he brought to the podium, that summer day, you would not find in his speech at all the words, I have a dream. In fact, the March of Wa on Washington wasn't called the March on Washington at all. It was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. That was the actual name of the march, and that was the point of his message. And if you listen to the audio of his speech in the background, you can hear the great singer Mahalia Jackson in the background, the only woman, by the way, who was on the podium that day the only woman. And as he is going through his notes, and you can see him looking down most of the time, but in the background you can hear this voice, and when you sang as beautifully as Mahalia Jackson did, it was a voice that you couldn't ignore. And so in the background, she's telling him, tell them about the dream mind, and he keeps ignoring her, and she keeps whispering. Tell them about the dream, because he had first talked about the dream two months earlier in Detroit, and she was there and she heard him. And so she is constantly telling him. And finally, he just yields, and you see him, he is no longer looking down, and now he is looking up. His message was actually not intended to be about the dream. It was about making certain that we be indeed what we say we are in word that fundamental argument about internal consistency that's reflected in the, in the great ideals of the nation. So it's true he was a dreamer and a thinker, but he was probably a doer more than anything else. More than anything else, he was a doer. Speeches are powerful and they're impactful, but we remember them simply because of the actions that follow them. That's why they mean something. That's why they incite us to think differently. So after the Montgomery bus boycott that he led, reluctantly so, by the way, our government would strike down bus segregation. And every time that he stood for something that he believed to be powerful and important, something fundamentally changed, was altered, was constructed. And yet we still resonate with his story and with his message because I think there's some part of us that feels and believes that we need it more than ever. We live in a society that's overscheduled, and we're, we're checking our Facebook postings and see how many followers we have on, on Twitter. And my, my daughter, who's seven years old, created an Instagram account, which is brand new to me, and tells me she has 19 followers. And I'm like, well, baby girl, you're seven years old. What do you have 19 followers for? So there is this temple of me that we seemingly serve at, constantly. And to be perfectly candid, I don't think Dr. King would be interested in what time we woke up and how many followers we had or how many followers he had. He was a lot more invested and a lot more interested, it seemed to me, to whether or not we lived a life of service for others. That was the ideal that he lived by 
that was the ideal that he strove towards. And it's even more critical in this, in this time that we begin to look a lot deeper at what we traditionally mean by diversity and the way in which we view it. My travels today take me all across the world from the halls of Congress where I've testified to meetings with business leaders. And I can tell you that when you ask them for their organizations, whether it be the institutions that they lead, the businesses that they run, they will tell you that somewhere in their top three priorities is this issue of diversity. And that might strike you as surprising, but when you hear the same theme consistently over and over again, it begins to strike a chord with you that perhaps there is something that's fundamentally shifting in our society, this need for us to architect and create a very different language than the one that, that we've inherited. So diversity is an immutable fact. It is here. It's not going away. And it is as certain as the air that you breathe. But we are not armed with the language to talk about it in the way that reflects those future shifts and changes. We get mired in ideology and running to this camp and that camp, furiously defending our, our position and being none the wiser, and in some cases, probably worse for it. Those who, on either side of the spectrum, who use diversity and difference as that cord around which they can alienate and entrench themselves in positions that don't advance our life, our cause. And that seems to me to be the, end, the exact opposite of what Dr. King was talking about. I think diversity is becoming a lot less about how you look, and it's a lot more about how you think, and whether or not you are culturally aware and culturally invested. I work at Walgreens, a Fortune 30 company with annual revenues of $75 billion. And our top three priorities in our top three priorities is how are we responding to a global marketplace in an American landscape that is rapidly shifting. I have a very large team that reports into me. And I know you've heard the phrase many times that great minds think alike. You know what I think? One of those minds is redundant. <laughs> I do not need two people on my team who see an issue the exact same way. I want difference of thought and difference of opinion. And if you're interested in the salary continuation program, then you're going to, on my team, understand that's how we operate. So we test, we challenge. We can look across the room and ask someone, what do you think? And never really advance our own position until we talk with somebody whose views are diametrically opposed to ours. That's how we're enlightened, and that's how we learn. So this changing world that we're in demands cultural flexibility. It is not a time and a season for those who are only interested in their own point of view. You'd have a hard time and will have a hard time competing in a global society if you don't have cultural flexibility and a willingness to see things through a different lens, an experience that is fundamentally different than your own. What's different in your time and in your generation is now it's a requirement. It's what's being demanded of you. It is no longer an option. No longer. It always strikes me as inconsistent, though, our current construct around diversity. And I can tell you having that title in, in your role and responsibility, you have to explain to people all the time what it means and what it is and oftentimes what it isn't. We live in two very enduring systems that are bedrocks of our society. One is our federal system of government, predicated on checks and balances, or said a bit differently, diversity of thought, which makes sense. Because when you come from an environment where the king can tax you at will, where you have no say, it would stand to reason that you would create a system of government that would make certain that you had different views around the table before you made a decision. 
And when you look at the great history of our country, you can see we have gotten ourselves in trouble when we have run down a single path of uniformity rather than inviting difference to the table. And conversely, you can see our greatest victories have come when we have incorporated different mindsets into that conversation. You will leave here at some point, and I'm sure that your own travels will take you to great success, and you'll have the option one day of investing your money. The first principle of investing your money is to diversify. It's the one time that we actually use diversity as a verb when we talk about investing our money. And any financial advisor would tell you the reason that you diversify is to mitigate risk. So you diminish risk by increasing your options as opposed to looking at one particular thread of thought. And yet somewhere along the way, we lost some of that understanding. We got derailed. And you see some of those same debates from those who love diversity and those who are opposed to it, furiously fighting and still not necessarily advancing the cause as quickly and perhaps as necessarily as it should. And if we don't become aware of the, the critical need for us to look at this differently, then our ability to compete as a, as a nation on a global platform is going to be challenged. Those are the hard realities. And that is why you're so important, because I suspect that in a lot of your experiences, you bring that ability to see things differently. And to the degree that I can, or any of us can, we want to encourage you to share those things, those, those perspectives. You know, I said earlier that so much of how I see this comes from my own personal experience. I've never forgotten those days, and I never will forget those days of not simply belonging, looking different, having that different last name, and those looks of pity and empathy, empathy, things that would strip me of my dignity with a single glance, those looks that said, you don't belong. And I remember what I was called, that I was beyond hope, beyond repair, that I was dumb, that something about me was not quite right, that I was ugly. I'm still trying to figure out the ugly part now. I mean, take a good look at this profile. Just want you to. <laughs> All this African American and Cape Verdean and Irish and German and Dominican running through my running through my veins. How dare you call me ugly? <laughs> Nobody in this room is ugly. Nobody. Nobody. Foster family that raised me saw me as little more than a paycheck. And I remember, too, the things they called me as well. But they had very little understanding for that which was residing in me. I'd like to tell you that I was taken in by a wonderful foster family who saw not the circumstances of my life, but its possibilities. That wouldn't be true. I never found that place. So as a result, I'm not from a place. I was born in New Bedford, and that is where I spent my childhood years. But it's not home. And I will never know home in the traditional way that most people will know home. I will never know a mother's love, and I will never know a father's love. And it was because of some of the things that I mentioned earlier that those who were responsible for my care did not see me as a boy. I was a label. I was biracial. I was something to them other than what I truly was, which was just a boy with big dreams of finding his own family one day. And I didn't want to be defined by a color, not when there were more important things at stake. And so because of this desire, this need that sometimes perhaps is innate to all of us to put people in a box and to define them singularly, that cost me my childhood, and one that I cannot get back, one that can never be returned to me. It's just not possible. And all it took was someone to look at me just a little bit differently, just a little bit differently. And unfortunately, it never happened. I'm not sad about that. 
I am today married to my wonderful wife of 16 years, and I am the proud father of my darling Quinn, my son Vaughn, my daughter Kennedy. So they have healed all of that, and they have made it okay. And so now I get to experience childhood through their eyes, and it's the closest that I come to knowing a childhood and what, what simply could have been. The day after my college graduation, I walked across the stage just like this and grabbed the diploma and I looked at that last name of Klackowitz and I knew it wasn't mine. I knew it didn't fit. And so off I went on a search for my biological family. And I did find them. I discovered that I was one of my mother's six children, all with different fathers, a reflection of the alcoholism that she suffered and would ultimately cost her her life. My father, once one of the top amateur fighters in the world, one of 13 children, who never told anybody that he had a son. So when he's tragically murdered, when I'm five years old, nobody knows that I exist. And so off I go. And as I discover the narratives of their lives, my mother didn't know what to do with me because my father was African American. And my father was African American, couldn't fully embrace me because my mother was white. And that too would cost me a childhood, a very different path as a result. Many years later, after I find my biological family, after years of sitting on this rock wall across the street from this foster home and dreaming of family and home in the traditional way that we think of it, and when I found the Murphy family and I found the Pemberton family, they did not embrace me. They asked me, what are you doing here? They had packed me away and it packed away my father's life, and it packed away my mother's life. So here I come, stomping back through time, 20 years later, looking very much like my father, and bringing my siblings along with me, who are all white. And I just never expected that they would ask me, what are you doing here? And I was left with the most challenging question of my life. Well, now what do you do? What do you do? When those things that you sought and desperately tried to find don't want you. And the answer for me was I had to look deeper because their rejection of me actually had very little to do with the fact that my mother was white and that my father was black. It, was, had, it had to do with something much more universal and that was pain and loss and suffering. And they wanted to simply close the door and have no reminders. So the answer for me was that I had to stand there and I would not walk away. I couldn't walk away. I couldn't. I say to my oldest brother Ben all the time, if you walked down this row right here, you'd have no idea that we're related because there is no physical resemblance between us. But he is my brother and there's nothing that I wouldn't do for him and he for me. We inherited circumstances that we didn't ask for, that we didn't create, but we wanted the opportunity to right the, that wrong. Ben's a surfer dude, completely opposite. And so he'll call my children all the time. They love talking to him because Ben is, is not married and doesn't have children, so he rides around in his Porsche and hits the waves, and my children just think this is unbelievably cool. Uncle Ben, what you doing, what you doing? Hit the waves, dude. <laughs> but to them, that's their uncle, and so they don't see any of the things, the traditional labels that, that we might see. He emailed me one time as he was coming in, and he said, you know, I had this last big wave, and the sun was setting, and he said, I, I was just thinking about you. I just wanted to let you know. And I responded back and I said, Ben, we didn't have any say as to whether or not we could be brothers. We had no say about that. But we do have a lot of say as to whether or not we can be friends. And I am so very glad to call you my friend. So here's my call to action for you, because that's the importance of Dr. King's life. It's not enough to simply quote him or to remember something that he said if you can't apply it to your own life. You know, the one thing that we know for certain 
about an iceberg. We not, might not know how it's formed, we might not know where it's come from, but the one thing we know with absolute certainty is that which is above the water line is smaller than that which is below it. And people are just like that. So the things that you see above the water line, their race, their gender, where they're from, how they talk, whether or not they have a disability, those things are just the things that you see, those innate characteristics that you arrive into the world with. But then there are those things that are below the water line that are much bigger and deeper. That's who you are. It's not the things above, although they are a part. And you need look no further than John Palfrey's remarks this morning for you to see just how important those things below the water line are. Because I dare say that prior to him talking about it, none of us here knew, except for a few, that that was part of his experience and part of his life and part of his background and part of the narrative of his story that he carries with him. And that's a lot more important than simply looking at someone and say, well, there's a white man. Because now you know he is certainly a lot more than that. And then, so are you. Over the next few days, I hope that at some point you'll take a moment and look at someone else's iceberg and ask them about their experiences. And don't allow them to answer you in the traditional way that I'm African American, I'm disabled, I'm Hispanic, I'm Asian. Whatever those labels are, whatever those signifiers are, they, they aren't your story. And whatever you hear, whatever comes back to you when you listen, when you use your mouth and ears in the proportion they were given to you, you'll realize that that story you hear of that person, that story's not written upon them. You don't really know until you ask and until you be willing to listen and to learn and to fully hear because that is in essence the measure of someone. And I know that from experience because of the life that I've lived. And I think about Dr. King on this day because of the number of people who did small things in, in my life. Across the wall, across the street from this foster home where I love to read, that was my passion, that was what I did, was reading. It gave me vision, values, a sense of direction. And despite the insidious and very violent rules of this foster home, I dove into books and they became my armor and they protected me and they gave me a sense of a different life. And it's there that I had a dream of a family one day. And so tonight I'll fly back home to Chicago with wonderful memories of this time with you. And as soon as I open the door, my darling children, Quinn, or the mighty Quinn as we call him, and Vaughn, the valiant one, whose life philosophy appears to be jump and then figure it out on the way down. <laughs> and Kennedy, who is unequivocally daddy's girl. They will run to me, and they will drown me in hugs and kisses, even though I saw them just a few hours ago. And they'll hug me as if I've been gone for a month. That, in many ways, was my dream coming true. And I had that dream a really long time ago. I believed that I had a right to a different life than the one that I inherited. We all come into this world as inheritors, if you think about that inheritors of something, all of us. You inherited something, it was a name, and it could be great fame, it could be great wealth, and it could also be great tragedy. But ultimately, we are measured not by those things we inherit, but by those things that we build. That is our measure, that is what defines us. And you need look no further than Dr. King's life to see the power and the impact of that which you dare to dream that which you dare to believe in, and that which you dare to build. And I hope that over the next couple of days that you will leave here and leave this conversation, not remembering exactly what I said, because I'm keenly aware that you've had many before me and you'll have many after me. The real measure will be whether or not there is somebody else you meet in the next couple of days who you may have seen just in passing, and all you have offered is a hello to, and you take a couple of minutes and learn their story and that somewhere you see a connection to your own story and you see that commonality and that common ground, that will be the measure 
of Martin Luther King Day here in 2013. And so I'm honored and incredibly grateful that you would have me here. Thank you. Thank you. Because Mr. Pemberton did indeed keep his remarks brief, brother, thank you, uh, that means that we do in fact have time for some questions. So um, I'd like to give an opportunity for students to come to the mics on either side uh, and please line up if you have a question and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy this segment as well. So. Um, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk corporate a little bit, if we could. So, um, would you want to uh, okay, so I'm Brian. I'm a lower, new lower from Andover, Massachusetts. So I'd like to talk corporate a little bit. So you're a Fortune 30 company. Um, how do you find that you can translate the principles that you use for diversity across industries in big companies like Walgreens? Mm. Well, I can tell you that there's some real practical matters uh, that affect us. Uh, as an example, we have been laser-like focused on our footprint in the Hispanic community because we know of population trends that are emerging. So we know that our customer base is changing overnight. Uh, last um, October, we made a $45 billion investment, $4.5 billion investment in Alliance Boots, which is our global partner. So all of a sudden, Walgreens, which has been around for 110 years, now has become a global company. And we hire about 60,000 people a year. So you can imagine what's happened since October, right? And, and the places that um, I am going and will be going as a result of having to respond to all of these demographic shifts and, and changes. For us, it's not that, you know, certainly we do, the, the Hispanic culture mean a great deal to us, of course it does as part of the character of the company. But here's a hard reality. If we are not attentive to what Walgreens looks like to our Hispanic customers and what it feels like to them, uh, our competition will beat us every quarter. And that's just a hard reality. We are focused laser-like all disability initiatives at Walgreens report to me. We are to the point where we measure the aisles in our stores to make sure that if you're in a wheelchair, you can get down the aisle. Not just for that customer, but because we know that if you have a disability and are in a wheelchair, then you come what we call tethered to other customers. Those are just two really quick examples. But it's not the only one. Uh, Google, as an example, has created this group of employees, this group of employees created this group called the Googleitos which is not a new Latino culture. It's just what Google's very clever way of creating their own group. What that group's mission was and is, is to take a look at Google's products and services to make sure that they reflect the marketplace that is leveraging their services. Because they know that most of the people who use the internet do not speak English. And so that they need to reflect their services accordingly. And across industries, and I sit down with these CEOs and I can tell you that that's examples of and how they're pushing and pressing us. It's a very different landscape than the one that we've come from. My name is Darlena, I'm a senior from New York and um, Many people who have faced the same circumstances that you have might not have gotten to where you are today. So my question is, what makes you different? Mm. What makes me different? Ooh, that might be a second book. <laughs> Honestly, I don't really know. I don't know. Um, you can't convince me I'm special. 
Um, no more than the Foster family could convince me that I was worthless, and God knows they tried. Never worked. Similarly, so you can't convince me that there's something extraordinary about me. I simply saw wrong and tried to right it, and had a vision of a very different life. And I knew I had a right to it, and I believed that if I just hung in there and fought, that I would. And that is probably what is, I'll, I'll confess, early on, probably I had a little bit different. I would fight you. I'd fight you. Uh, I didn't fight in the traditional way, not with my hands, per se, although I was tempted several times. Um, I fought with my mind and my focus on the classroom in, in particular. Uh, you know, across um, the street, that rock wall that I described and I wrote about, uh, the Foster family never gave me books, so I would read the same book over and over again. And one day, this woman comes along. I don't even really, I can't look at her because the rules of this place are terrible, which is one I can't make eye contact, so I'm looking at you now. But back then, I couldn't make eye contact with an adult because they were always afraid that they would see what was happening. So I always had to look down and look at your feet in particular. So this woman who approaches, I see her feet first. And it's why to this day that I can tell you that she was wearing tennis sneakers. They had a ring of blue rubber that went around them. The left one was scuffed just a little bit more than the right. And she was wearing uh, blue pants that didn't go all the way down to her ankles. I was eight years old. And the long and the short of it is that she saw me reading that same book over and over again. Uh, and that night brought me a box of books. And she would do this periodically through the years, just bring me a box of books. And I had maybe two or three conversations with her my entire childhood, and few of them were nothing more than a hello. And that was all they were. Many, many years later, I write the book, and uh, I'm learning when you do something that goes viral, uh, people have a way of adopting you. And so these wonderful people in New Bedford went to go find her, and they did find her. And so I can tell you, 35 years after that act of kindness, uh, that her name is Claire Levin. She's 78 years old today. Her husband's name is Fred. They own a fishing net business. Very, very humble people. But when you talk about service and expecting nothing in return and how that can change a life, I'm thinking about her when I think about that. So it wasn't just enough will, right? Because I have that. I'll confess that. Uh, I, I, I don't bend easily. I'll bend, but not easily. And I definitely do not break. I don't break. But you can only get so far before you need to be around people who will just pour a little water on your seed, which is what she was. It wasn't just her, it would be several others as well. So I don't want to stand before you and say, oh, there's something extraordinary about me. There, there were people along the way who, even though there was never that one person who said, come in, I'll take you, I'll adopt you, but there were enough. And they, made, they didn't make a difference, they made the difference. Two-letter difference, but a really, really different word. Thank you. Chia, do you want to take the mic? Thank you. Mr. Pemberton, thank you. That was pitch perfect. Truly beautiful. <laughs> I loved it. You can sing. I, I wondered if, I actually didn't mean to stand in front of a student and take the mic, but I did it anyway, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I really did offer to see if she wanted to go next. But I wonder if I might ask of you some free consulting. You are one of the leaders in this country in thinking about issues of diversity and multiculturalism. You have the perch of being atop one of the great corporations in our nation. Mm -hmm. And um, on a much smaller scale, here we are in Andover, Mass. And I often think of my job as being in two parts. One as being a head teacher, which is the literal term, and then as being the CEO of a small nonprofit. We spend $100 million a year. We have a set of principles. We have 600 people who work here. We have 1,140 beautiful, all beautiful students. We have outreach programs in the summer. We do all sorts of things. But we are a little tiny corporation, technically, in fact, a corporation. And we commit ourselves to the ideals that you have described and that LCG has described and that we've 
heard here, it's seared into our fabric in the best possible way, like really, really there. I truly believe it. But I know we are imperfect. And with my CEO cap on, I wonder what would you say either to the Walgreens CEO or more easily, I suppose, to me as the CEO of a place like this, what can we do better? What are the things that in the next 10 years we ought to focus on to live exactly the way you have described it as a community? And to the extent that there's advice there that you're willing to share with our faculty or other adults in the community, you've spoken to the kids, but we are also the adults here with a certain degree of responsibility. I wonder what advice you'd give me if you'd be willing. Ah. Well, I'll, I'll be, I'm going to stick to my five B's advice. That's a great question. One that you might expect I get with some frequency. Uh, so so uh, a few things come to mind, John. The, the, the first is, I think, for in all candor, I'm speaking corporately, for the last 25 years, we've had our ladder against the wrong wall. We have basically said, our problem is this innate and reckless discrimination. That's our problem. So let us find these people, these discriminatory people, these bad people. Let's train them like they're SEALs. And we do this especially with white males. Let us train you in the ways of diversity. And then once you're trained, you are now a good person. And now we are fully equipped to head out into the world and now be a diverse person. That ideology is fundamentally flawed. My grandfather, Joe Murphy, came from Ireland. First month that he was here, he lost his mother. Second month that he was here, he lost his father. He saw signs that said, Irish and dogs need not apply. He too was in orphanages. He went off to war, World War II, would be wounded three times, would lose my mother. My mother died uh, and it crushed him. He's gone now. I never had the chance to meet him, but I couldn't stand in front of him and say, well, Grandpa, let me tell you about how tough it was for me, to which he would say, grandson, really, really, you're going to lecture me about loss and suffering and pain. You know more about this than me because you're black. You know more about this than me because you grew up in foster care. I grew up there too. I don't think we'd have that conversation because I think I would see in him and he and me that commonality to right a wrong. So I think the traditional way that we've gone about this, John, is all wrong. Rather than looking at that person and saying, well, let me size you up and let me figure out what's wrong with you and what's wrong with you. And then let me teach you. Hasn't gotten us particularly far. I think creating environment and language and context that empowers people as opposed to alienating them, as opposed to running off into our camps and say, well, are, are you an opponent or a proponent of affirmative action, of gay marriage, of that, which is only, the question itself is only intended to alienate and to disconnect us rather than tell me how and why you feel about this. What I say at Walgreens and to a lot of corporations, what I said before Congress, it wasn't particularly popular. They invited me there to testify. Uh, I was the only business leader allowed to testify, and they fired their first eight questions at me, so on C-SPAN and everything. Unbelievable. I couldn't figure out what I was saying that was so controversial. What I was saying was so controversial was I said, you're both wrong, Republicans and Democrats, you're both wrong. I haven't gotten audited yet, so I guess they took it all right. But they were running to these, these corners. And so they said, well, what do you do? Well, the first thing I think you do is you incorporate it into the overall mission of the institution and of the organization, rather than treating it as a side car. As a practical matter, if the only time we're talking about matters of diversity and inclusion, whether it's at Walgreens or here, is on MLK Day, then that's a problem. So it's got to be incorporated into our overall language. And for us, that's, that's the overarching point. We do measure how we're feeling. Not, not just about representation, but about engagement as well. Uh, because it's not enough to look around the room and say, well, gee, we've got two of these and three of those and four of those and five of those, and so we're diverse. It's so limiting, isn't it? It's so limiting, as, as your story reflects as well. The, the point is whether or not we're learning something from one another. Uh, and I say all the time, as I will say to my own children, if you leave this magnificent institution and you leave here and head off to college and you say, 
well, you know, I kind of have the same group of friends that I had when I entered here. And you do that in college, too. To me, it's almost like going to the 13th grade. Like, that's not the point of life. You know, the point of life is to embrace difference and to see that commonality and to see that common ground. It's not always perfect. I have a sister, my biological sister, who doesn't talk to me because I'm black. And that's the truth of it all. She refuses to talk to me because I'm African American. And try as I might, I've not been able to heal that within her. But I see that as her loss and her pain. So it's not always perfect, but I'm going to try. I'm going to do everything that I can and then see where and how and what, and what comes of it. I can tell you that as you're developing and as you're growing, the issue is now not an option. I mean, that's just the, the, the truth of it all. Part of our success is because we see it coming. And we know if you did a simple census projection and looked at America in 2020, you're going to see states like Oklahoma in our current context that are going to be 20% Hispanic, as an example communities that are changing and developing and morphing overnight. But we've got to make sure that we are breaking down those traditional walls and barriers, that we're not eating lunch, for example, with the same kinds of people. That's, you're cheating yourself in a, in, a, in, in a way. And yet, you can stand firm and strong. I am proudly African American. That's the tradition that I come from. But I'm also, I'd like to think, wise enough to know um, that I've got a lot to learn, which is how I think about it. I, I am first and foremost a student, and I always will be. Uh, you know, my wife and daughter often remind me I'm not the feminist that I think I am. <laughs> What's my point? We all have something to give. We all do. And we all have something to learn. It's the giving part. It's the giving part. And controversial though this may be, I don't want anybody to hold their breath when I say this, but I've locked looked at a lot of people who have been around the diversity and inclusion space, and they have done a terrible job of fully embracing other experiences beyond their own. They have. And part of my responsibility is to challenge that mindset and to say, well, I don't speak another language. I'm trying to learn Spanish. That's my responsibility. I have to be what I'm asking others to be. I have to be invested. And I have to be willing to set an example for what I'm asking others to do as well. Otherwise, everything that I suffered through and endured is for naught. It's for naught. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank John. you for this advice. Um, and may I ask you all one thing? This morning I was bragging about you all, which is the extent to which. 1140 students can actually be silent when there is another speaker in the room. You've been awesome for an hour plus. Yes. I suspect there aren't that many questions, but please go for that pin silent thing that you can do when Mr. Pemberton is speaking, and thank you for the respect. Hi, my name is Chiamako Corey. I'm a senior from the Bronx, New York, and you spoke about diversity, and my question is, how can you talk about diversity and differences without making one group the bad guys and making the other group the good guys? And when you talk about awareness, can you make someone aware without making them uncomfortable? Do the two have to go hand in hand? So you, you said, how can you talk about diversity when you have good guys and bad guys? And Well, you know, I, I think that in many ways that's, that's the issue. Uh, we, we have done such, uh, we have a tendency, it feels to me, as if we demonize difference. Uh, and there's perhaps a degree of it that is uncomfortable. And I think that, that, that that's okay. But it's when you make those immediate snap judgments. And I don't think you fully get there when you have these alienating positions that I've seen. I say all the time at Walgreens, uh, there are certain people I just simply will not allow them to come to the company to consult us on matters of diversity because their cadence is off. They're not trying to create a culture and an environment that we can fully embrace and support. They look to alienate. They look to antagonize, all in this case for financial gain. So I tell them, I don't need you. I don't need you. And a lot of times our CEO says, you know, and these are some very influential people who are well known. But in some ways, where Walgreens has been, Charles Walgreen, his first employee was African-American. He took stands in the middle of Jim Crow on 
equal pay for pharmacists, as an example. So am I inclined to sit there and be lectured to by somebody else who doesn't know any of that history? No, I'm not. At the same time, that's true for us as individuals. And when you have this kind of good people, bad people perception, I suspect you don't have it. And I can definitely tell you that I don't, but I have seen it repeatedly. It's sobering because I know it doesn't really advance things uh, as a result. So the, again, the fundamental challenge in front of us is to overcome those things so that, that discomfort that you're talking about is a natural thing. I mean, I go through it daily uh, in my own home because I'm obviously not a woman, right? So, you know, my daughter, all the time, I'm always, like, cautious because she's very quick to tell me. At seven years old, she's seven years old. And she's always very quick to remind me, and especially her brothers, I can do what you can do. And I make sure that I affirm that as well. This, it's, it's okay to be uncomfortable. It, that, that's fine. And that's part of the, the human condition, I think, is to want to run to those things. And the best example of that was what I encountered when I found my family, because I can honestly tell you, my heart of hearts, the easiest thing for me to do, and I almost did this. I almost did it. I was so furious that after all those years of suffering through that, that when I found my mother's family, they asked me, what are you doing here? I just, there was nothing in my constitution that allowed me to understand that and my father's family as well, including one of my uncles who said, well, you know, you're not really one of us because your mother's white. What? I mean, that reaction, the quiet. And I could have <laughs> run, but get you. I don't need you. I've never needed you. So you go stand over there in your racist corner let me live my life. Stay away from me. I could have done that. And I was tempted to. But I had to stand there and look below the waterline. What was that really about? What was it really about? Was it what I thought it was about? Was it about my race? It wasn't. The death of my mother was the greatest pain of her family's life. And they just, their reaction to that was, I don't want any reminders. I don't. So, Steve, you're bringing back all these reminders. And I'm thinking, I'm just looking for my family. Same thing is true with my father's family as well. It wasn't because my mother was white. It was just his reaction to seeing somebody who reminded him of all that he had lost when my father died. I'm trying to tell you that there are times you have to look further and you have to make stands. And what has come from it, when I hear my children talk to my oldest brother, or when I spend time with my father's family, I think to myself how fortunate we all are that we dared to write a different chapter than the one that we inherited. It wouldn't have happened if I had run to those good people, bad people corners. So now that's the legacy that I leave for my children. I have had the name Pemberton for less than half my life. But they've never known life without it. And that's the way that it should be. It's what I thought for. It's what I dreamed of. It's what I thought was possible. So now that's our collective responsibility, is not to run to those corners, uncomfortable though they may be, but actually to overcome, as I, as I felt I had to do. It's, it's, to me, after being a father, uh, it's probably the greatest victory of my life, to have stood there and have dared to look deeper. My life would not nearly be as rich if I hadn't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, I'm Michaela Rabb. I'm a upper from Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, you say how much you value education as a way to achieve success. However, as people who all go to school, how can we find the most, make the most of our education to actually get somewhere successful in life as you have done? Mm -hmm. Education leveled the playing field for me. It was the single greatest driver. So when I had all those slings and arrows, those labels that I was called, names, um, I'm, you know, I wasn't cool back then. I, mean, I might not be cool now. 
but I remember those, those looks, right? And you just don't forget them. You don't dwell on them, but you don't forget them. But I knew the classroom was my domain, and you just couldn't touch me there. You couldn't. So you couldn't tell me that I wasn't smart. Couldn't. Even though I was very quiet, I didn't say much, uh, it gave me that foundation that I needed. And Michaela, it's something that I continued to leverage today. Uh, I decided a few years ago, as an example, that I was, going, uh, I was going to finally write a book. I'm an executive, I'm too busy to write a book, so I hired a ghostwriter. That's what I did. The way a ghostwriter works, he sits down, and he or she interviews you, and then they write the, the story. And that was the deal that I sold to the publisher. And I realized after we signed the deal with the publisher that we're having a conflict, which is he wants to write my life story another way than I want to. Very curious, because it's my life story, so I don't understand that. We got into two arguments. One was over a reference to material things, and he wanted to talk about all the, you know, all this. And I said, no, that's not me. It's not who I am. I would never talk about that. And the other was over my mother, a woman I have no memory of. And he wanted to refer to her life in a certain way. I told him no once, I told him no twice. Second time I told him no, I said, if you mention this again, our relationship's over. He said, you don't have a choice. Because the publisher has said that I'm gonna write the book, you tell the story, I write the book. So you don't have a choice. You gotta do it my way, really. Really. And I remember looking across from him, and I remember thinking, I just fired you. <laughs> I didn't say it at the time, right? I got a problem, Kayla. I'm not a writer. I called the publisher back and said, look, this ghostwriter thing's not working out. Uh, so uh, we got to go in a different direction. They said, what direction is that? You're not a writer. Uh, so who's going to write it? And I said, no, well, actually, I'll write it. I'll write it. And they said, well, how are you going to do that? And I said, well, here's what we'll do. I'll write the first chapter and give you an outline of the book. I'll call you, you read it, and then you decide whether or not I can write it. They said, good, call us in three weeks. I said, it won't take three weeks. It takes three days. Today's Friday. I have the first chapter on Monday and the outline. Let's have a conference call. We get on a conference call. There's 20 people on the line, and it's just me, and I can hear it. And I'm thinking they want their money back. <laughs> I thought they had attorneys and all that on the phone. And they read the first chapter. And I can hear them crying. And so I realize, okay, I, I, I will be the one to write it. What does that have to do with education? My ability to write that book began on that rock wall reading and making the classroom my domain even though I never imagined it was possible, but it gave me the foundation. It's why I could write a chapter in a day. And why would, even though the editors have a field day with editing books, they, hadn't, they didn't touch it. Because I had that foundation early on. I always wanted to be the absolute best student that I could be. I never confused that with student leadership. Student leadership's important and necessary and critical, but it can't come at the consequence of your academic life. That's gotta be first. Last point, it gives you vision, see, it gives you vision. So you could not tell me that I wasn't going to find my family one day. You couldn't tell me I wasn't going to be a husband. You couldn't tell me I wasn't going to be a father. You couldn't tell me, you couldn't put those labels on me. You could not do it, couldn't do it. Couldn't tell me I was worthless. Couldn't tell me I didn't have value because I knew I was the smartest kid in my class. And I knew that I would fight you to the very end. So when the foster family tells me, you're not going to college. And for years I had been silent about everything that had happened in that home. And I got that PSAT form that I know you all love. <laughs> and I got that. And I remember the foster mother flung it at me and said, who said you're going to college? And you know if you say anything, what's going to happen to you? Which I, which I took to mean, you're gonna die. Because they threatened me daily like that. 
And I said, then I'll die then. I'll die. For my love of education, for what it was going to give me in terms of a future, that's what I'm willing to do. And it might be the only thing I do in my life at 14 years old that I own, but I'm going to own it. So if taking that exam is going to cost me my life, then it will have to cost me my life. It was the most galvanizing moment of my life. It was a time that I made a stand, even though I thought I was going to die for it. And I did believe that, and, it, and I nearly did. But I look at that risk, that sacrifice, and all that's come from it, and how important and powerful that was. Best decision I made after marrying my wife, that is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One more. Tough to follow that. <laughs> uh, my name is Henry, and I was wondering if you um, were a religious person yourself and how that influences maybe your life and your business decisions um, coming from that. Henry, is it? Yes. Daily. Daily. I didn't come to faith in, in the traditional way. I went to church one time in my entire childhood. And that one time I went, I sat in the wrong class and It was a Sunday school class, and that was the first time I heard about this being called God. And I remember the Sunday school teacher said, well, you know, you can talk to God. There weren't any Bibles in the house. You can talk to God the way that you do a best friend. So that's what I would do. And in, in the way that I came to faith was, in essence, realizing that my prayers didn't always get answered. In fact, I, I made that the beginning of one of the chapters, that God doesn't come when you call, but he's right on time which for me was pretty much how I, how I symbolized the story for me. It's, it's actually almost entirely a story about faith, almost entirely. Uh, there's some secondary themes like resilience and fortitude and vision and values and all those things, yes, but it's first and foremost a story about faith and what happens when you simply dare to believe because there's no earthly reason. You didn't hear me. There's no earthly reason. I should be standing here. The title of the book, A Chance in the World, wasn't one that I came with. It was the diary entry of a babysitter who saw me at one and a half years old and said, this little boy doesn't have a chance in the world. That was the prediction for what I would become. He got it wrong. He got it wrong. Why was that? And not that I'm, I'm definitely not a preacher, but I can tell you that my, my favorite scripture is when your mother and father forsake you. It will be the Lord who will lift you up. And that sits with me all the time because I was forsaken. I was. But I was lifted up by so many people who did small things. So why, it's why when I'm here, right, and I, I, I hear John Palfrey or spend some time with LCG, or, or, or Aya. Like, that's like family to me. I don't, I'm, you, you know what I mean? When you don't have family in that traditional way, the, the relationships, the people you meet, they call to you in a way. There's a spirit. There's something about them that you connect to. And that, to me, is part of a greater connectivity that we all have. There's a line I wrote in the book, and I used to stare in the mirror at him. I used to look all the time. I'm like trying to figure out, well, what do you look like? Me. Have you ever done that? Have you ever looked in the mirror and it scare you? Like, not that you... You're all handsome. That's not what I mean. You get what I mean, right? But if you sit there and look at the mirror, you're like, ooh. Mirrors aren't to reflect what you see. They're sometimes to correct what you see. And I used to look in the mirror, and I used to go, well, I'm not trying to figure out what my race is. I'm trying to figure out where I've come from, because that's a lot more important. And ultimately, that came to me through, through faith. And that faith has been rewarded time and time and time again. I, got, I wrote the book, Henry, I got rejected by so many publishers. It's like this huge, big stack, 23 to be precise. I haven't forgotten. All it took was one, just one. And that's how something like a book comes from it. And now I, I hear from people all over the world. It stuns me. I mean, from all walks of life saying, thank you for writing my story. Thank you for writing my mother's story, my uncle's story, my sister's story. So when you get your story down, you have no idea the impact it has, the power. And it's a lot bigger, hear me now, it's a lot bigger than those traditional labels, those things above the waterline. It's a lot more powerful and it's a lot more important. I'm gonna write another book, you got me so excited here. <laughs> thank you, thank you everybody, thank you.
Thank you.